lived and conduct their lives as if God does not exist. Okay, that's how we were because the cravings and gratifying of our desires, the sin nature ruled over and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving or children of wrath. There's only one thing that all of us fully deserve, the wrath of God. Boy, that's a dark picture, isn't it? In an era when people want to be patted on the back for the smallest of achievements in their own life, they want a trophy for having gotten in 27th place. <laughs> it's just an odd thing to hear Paul strike at the heart of our pretension. When it comes to God, which is in the end the only real thing to be thinking about, when it, any evaluation that comes to us from God speaks to us of the reality of how he sees things. And he saw us dead, unable to make decisions on our own, following everything. We lived among them. That's number two. We gratified the cravings of our flesh, number three, and we followed the flesh desires and way of thinking or thoughts, number four. Now we come back to the sandwich. That was verse 1 and verse 3. But move back into the middle, verse 2. Here's how it reads. In which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. So Paul describes three influences on us here. Can you see the first one? The ways of the world. But then he takes it to the next level. We also followed the ways of the ruler of the kingdom of the air. Paul has a, a visual image here in mind of Satan, who is the god of this world, as he will call him in the book of Galatians, who have blinded the minds of sinners. So we, we were following the ways of the world, the pathways of this age, literally is what it says. Wow. Okay, so let's just talk a moment. What are pathways or ways that this world operates? Let's give some examples of ways the world operates. Get ahead at any cost. That's a... Boy, that's a good one. Mm -hmm. Sensual, right. Self comes first. Hmm. Yeah, the one who dies with enough toys wins. So I did it my way, and I want to do it my way. And nobody can tell me not. Doesn't that sound like a 13-year-old? I'm going to do it my way, and nobody can tell me how else I'm going to do it. I can, I can hear a 13-year-old in that. Any of you that lived with 13-year-olds will know that. <laughs> Even 14- and 15-year-olds can just, they just get more sophisticated in the way they say they want it their way. And that's a great uh, way to put that together by Eugene Peterson. Everything that we just said will come back again in chapter 4, but with a vengeance and with clarity. Paul, it's like the first time he went round, he went only so deep. Then he runs off in chapter 3 that does some wonderful things talking about the heavenly realm, but then he comes back to chapter 4 and bang, hits us in the head again with, beginning with verse 17 as to what's going on with our, what's the real reason why people are like this. So the last one is that we also follow the ways of the spirit now at work in those who are disobedient. That's not a good spirit, <laughs> right? 
but there's a spirit of the age that can be seen very clearly throughout history as not wanting much to do with God. Uh, and this is, I think, a pretty powerful point that Paul is making. And in fact, the message puts it in that clear term. We're all in the same boat. This is the way we were. So I want you to pause for a minute and look at this last question, last two questions that I had here, but really the one before the end. What does this depiction of a life under sin's sway look like to Paul when you put all this together? Can somebody summarize what he's saying? What, you, what hits you in the face when you read those? And notice we read those pretty carefully, didn't we? I think it hits you in the face when you read it more carefully, slowly and bit by bit. But what do you feel? What do you sense? <laughs> yeah, that's great. Hopeless. Yeah. Yeah, he snuck that one in there real nice, didn't he? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, so people get, uh, Dr. Lee said, their understanding for their way of conduct from social media, whatever. Not the word of God. So there's more at stake with biblical illiteracy than just that people don't know the stories. It means they don't know how to live. The Christian life. Yeah? Oh, Luanda, that's a great question. I can always rely on Don and Ray to throw something in here. This is good, Ray, really good. Uh, oh, I, thank you. It shocked me so much I forgot to repeat it, Jimmy. How does wokeness fit into uh, this discussion? What do you think? You had an idea by asking it, I think. Okay. Uh, so, uh, Ray was saying that Wokeness has a connotation of being almost against everything Christian, basically, that we've done up till now. So, okay, I, that really helps us because it tells us there are a couple ways we should think of this word woke and wokeness. One of them has to do with uh, sexual oppression of women, and that's certainly something that we've always been against, right, as Christians. And there's been some healthy awakening but what's taken over since then is what you're describing that nobody can say anything about what others are doing without getting clobbered or you might just make a mistake and say something that you didn't quite mean to say on facebook and 39,000 hits later you're in pretty bad shape yeah it's a it's a sad Place, I think that we're in that you can't even have a, a clear discussion without getting clobbered first. I assume that's more of what you were yeah. talking about, Ray. You can't have a culture without a leader. There, okay, yeah. Culture cannot be oh, right, yeah. So how do we come against that? How do we deal with that? I'm glad to hear that that more than just me are, are sitting thinking about that one and don't know for sure. Uh, because it's a, it's a slippery slope you get into. Uh, okay, so here's my answer. Please. Yeah, so, so we're at the place, says Ray, where good is now being spoken of as evil. And yeah, so there has to be a level of commitment to the truth of God's word for Christians regardless of the outcome of whatever stuff falls on us because of our stand. The trick for me is making sure I'm duplicating something of God's word and not just my own 
gut feeling about something. So I think that's where I would just admonish us as Christians, don't stop standing up for the word of God, but surely there are occasions when I need to have wisdom as to whether it, and discernment from brothers and sisters in Christ, whether what I'm hearing in the word is exactly what is necessary for right now. So wisdom isn't just knowing and discerning the right thing, it's also knowing the time to, to share the right thing, finding the right opportunity and how to do that as well. So I'm, I'm a little mixed on, uh, it just depends on what the woke thing is. Uh, but I think it's just really taken off negatively in so many ways. Good, good observation. So probably the one word that comes in my mind as to what this depiction looks like is, hopeless was a great phrase, but the phrase that came to mind was in, in later on in Ephesians 2, without God and without hope. That comes in a few more verses after this. This is how you were, without God and without hope. I just cannot think of a, of a greater misery in life. You don't have God and you therefore have no hope. You know, before Princess Diana, whose funeral was the largest attended in the world? A French ex existential philosopher named Jean-Paul Sartre. If you have read anything of Sartre, you will have recognized his basic idea was that existence is all we have. There is nothing out, there's no God to come, going to come save us. That's a, a figment of human imagination. There is nothing in this life except making authentic choices. He became so popular in post-World War II Europe that by the time of his death in 1981, 500,000 French people came to his funeral. The message was, there's nothing in life. There's no hope. There's no God to come rescue us. We live, we make our choices, we die. 500,000 people came to celebrate that man. That's where the world ended up after World War II. They felt that was much more authentic. They felt that was woke, <laughs> right? So that's a powerful statement to us. To me, it always felt without God, without hope. Yes, Don. Sure. Okay, so you, yeah.
So uh, Don was saying, and this this helps because I got to make sure I, I heard you well enough to get it right. Huh? Yeah. So correct me where I'm not right. The looking at people who are sinners or in the mode described here has a danger, I would say, for Christians kind of look at it and consider they're in some kind of mode of existence where many of them would not describe themselves as without hope. Um, many of them might see themselves as successful, even though we, we know that's temporary. The point I want to jump on is the fact that Paul's writing this to Christians. And when he does that, I think he's trying to get them to see you don't need to be so judgmental of the people that I'm describing here. Because guess what? Let's go back to the message. You're in the same boat. That's where you were. That's where I was. So I, rather than a point of judgment, I think for Paul it becomes a point of love. But it's not understood until you read verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy, and has loved us with an everlasting love in Jesus Christ. So we have to see how bad off we were in order to understand how good off we are now. That has absolutely nothing to do with how bad or good we were has everything to do with how great our God is. That, I think, motivates Paul to tell people about God, even those in sin. Now, the one other thing I would suggest, a little later on in the fifth chapter, he'll talk about light and darkness. Something that helped me a great deal many years ago was this phrase, and I don't remember where I got it but I remember praying about it, so I don't know if I got it in prayer or what. I shouldn't expect light out of darkness. So I think part of what you were describing, uh, Don, was an expectation that people should live a certain way when they don't have a motivation to live that way. They don't have a reason to. So I shouldn't expect people in darkness to have light. I should expect them to want to live in the dark and continue in that darkness because it's all they know. So what that does for us is instead of judging people who live in what we can now see as dark because we're in the light, we just want to shine the light more so that they're not, they can understand there's, not, uh, there's more hope than they think there is. Yeah, yeah Jimmy. Doesn't, so Jimmy was describing, did everybody hear? Maybe not. Um, I like the phrase, the image you get out of this is one of a captive, somebody who is taken over by the darkness and by the spirits of this age. Um, and they have no ability to know life otherwise. So have you ever heard the story of Plato's cave? Plato describes a story that I just find beautiful. Um, a man lives in a cave, he said, and be behind him is a high uh, precipice. And on top of that are things happening that the man chained at the bottom of the cave cannot see. So up above and behind him is some of this stuff going on. But the only thing the man can see who's chained to the wall down there is the wall in front of him in which there are shadows of figures going by. What's really up on the hill behind him is a fire 
and they're taking puppets in front of the fire, showing images of things. The shadows are what this man thinks are reality. That's all he's ever seen. Whereas the reality is up above him with people putting uh, puppets in front of the fire to make shapes up there. Then says Plato, this is just a wonderful image. What if someone were to come in that cave, remove the man's chains, take him up and show him that there are these things making the images? Would the man believe it? Plato thinks not. Then, more than anything else, you take the man outside of the cave and show him the sun so, so that he's blinded by it because he's never seen that light. After three days in the sun, suppose that man goes back in the cave and talks to the other prisoners there and says to them, look, there's a big light outside <laughs> that is real and it gives warmth and heat and light. And there are people up there doing the shapes up here. This is not real. This is the shadow. And that's the real world out there. Plato says, do you not think that evangelist will be derided as crazy because he has seen the light and they have not? What a story, huh? I'm surprised Paul didn't use that one in his uh, writings. But he may have hinted at it because he likes the play of light and darkness a lot, but the shadowy images there are just false shadows. It's not true. It's not real. So in some ways, what if we are like that one who has now seen the light and the people who live in darkness can hardly hear the good news because they don't know that it's good. They have no clue about reality. That puts a different motivation on soul winning, doesn't it, I think? Okay, let's do... Yes, Bill. I empathize with that. I do. Uh, so B Bill told the story of a scene that, uh, was he a street preacher or a beach preacher? <laughs> uh, wow. Yeah, and people can deride him, but what do you do even when you hear the truth? Uh, that's exactly it, I think. Let's turn to the second page, all right? And by doing so, we turn to Ephesians 4, 17 through 19. So we learned that was the way we were. In Ephesians 4, 17 through 19, we learned why we were the way we were. So Paul says the Gentiles live and walk. Let me read these two verses. And I'm only reading them because... I have the microphone, so it makes it easier for everyone to hear. So I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity, and here I'll read from the 1984 NIV, with a continual lust for more. 
the new NIV says, and they are full of greed. But I think the continual lust for more is actually a better one. Wow. We've got some stuff to look at here. Let's first of all begin with uh, the lines outside of some of these in this second page paragraph um, are to, for you to put some notes because I have some extra words that I can give you here as to what some of this is talking about, right? First, how did they walk? Literally, the word walk there can mean order their behavior. How do, how do we order our behavior? It's a walk for Christians, but it's also the way that they walked or ordered their behavior. First, they were living in the futility of their thinking. What is that? Futility. Here's what the word has as its meaning aimlessness. Have you know anybody that was without a goal or they had a goal and they couldn't achieve it? It can also mean the lack of getting or attaining the goal. So you're walking around without any goal that you, you get nothing done. Okay, so you, we all experience this at some level, right? You're walking around thinking, okay, I got a thousand things to do, but you focus so much on the thousand things that you, you just, you, you don't know which, where to even begin. Yes, some of you, maybe. That happens, I think, to all of us every now and then, and then we just have to buckle down and get it straight and start plowing through it. The, the, the world, those without Christ, never get to buckle down. Their mind, it's the thinking part here, which is the way they process how they would do it just spins. You know, on the uh, Google or on Microsoft Word, you ever seen the circle just keep going around? There's actually a word for that now. But, well, you know, the kids have made another word. It's a funny word that I, I'm going to have to ask one of them because I, I said, oh, I'm just buffering again. They said, no, it's something else. Uh, but it, it really is a... That's, that's, how, so that's how the world is in its mind. Now we're going to have to see because that isn't always the world. Some of us as Christians have buffering heads, right? Uh, so we'll, we'll look at that. So that's the way they think. It's aimless. Second, they are darkened in their understanding. The word dark here means to be blinded. They pulled all the shade shut and it's as dark as black dirt can get. What's the darkness over? It's over their understanding of things. They cannot understand especially anything about God or morality. At this point, I think we're describing something more instinctual. This is how I would, I'll be offensive at this point. This is how I would understand animals. So humans without God are a whole lot more instinctual in their nature. They're going to get what they want. And I don't care if it's I'm going to wipe you out getting there. It's all about what works for me. And they're darkened in how that, that treatment is actually mistreatment of others. They can't see it. They're blinded. They are separated from the life of God. Another way that you could say this word is estranged. They are shut out of intimacy with God. That's literally what it says. What a, what a, a wow, powerful image. You and I take so much for granted. Well, I'll say myself. I can't assume that with you. But I, I take for, so much for granted that God loves me and is intimate with me and wants to be intimate with me. It's how I understand God. I, I'm not sure what I would do if I didn't have that. If, if that was shut out to me and I could from this day forward never sense God's presence. Ay, ay, ay. Ay, That's not a direction I want to go. Imagine that is how people who are in this boat are living. So they're, 
wandering about aimless in their minds. They're darkened in their moral understanding, so they don't know any better. They are separated or estranged from the life of God. Then come two because words. Because of the ignorance in them. Which is because of the hardness of their heart. So here's, uh, here's an interesting point. Paul says people are ignorant toward God. Ignorant is just simply, it's not a mean word. It's a word that means they don't know. They are not knowing toward God because they have hardened their heart. This word for harden is a word for callous, literally. So they have calluses on their heart. They have resisted being sensitive to things about God. So calloused hearts lead to ignorant minds, which can clearly be seen in the fact that they have estrangement from the life of God and darkening in their moral understanding and futility in the way they think. But here comes the coup de grace, and then we'll talk a little bit about it. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality. What a great picture of what it means to be without Christ and without God in this world. They have no sensitivity to God, but they want to sense something. So they move themselves into the sensual world and realm. They have lost, they are past feeling. It's a way to describe this word sensitivity. So they have given themselves over to, and the word that is translated here, sensuality, is a word for sensuality without any restraint. There's no fence or boundary on that sensuality. So as to indulge or work or practice every kind of impurity or uncleanness. Anything else you can think of that fits in that category with a continual lust for more. So I, I don't think I've ever quoted Plato twice in anything, but he has another example that just screams at me about this one. He described a man leaving an area with a vessel and it had a hole in the bottom and he didn't know. So it's called the parable of the leaky vessel. And Plato then says, this is a lot how we are as human beings. Uh, we fill our vessels with things that we think are appropriate. There's always a hole in it. And we're always hungering to get the vessel filled back up. Th this just feels to me a whole lot. Uh, empty vessels as human beings want to be filled. So people will fill it with something that makes it feel right or feel better or feel something, sensuality, wherein the real hole that's in their heart is God. Augustine said that we're restless till we find our rest in him because there's like a, a God-sized hole in us that needs God to fit it. And we try filling it with everything else and that just doesn't work. What works instead is the fact that God fills that totally deep desire. Uh, we're back in touch with the one who created us, who made us, and who, in God's word, is described as someone who wants to be intimate with us. Okay, the, the circles here, uh, they're half my attempt to sketch on the computer a, a, a cause and effect kind of thing. What I wanted you to see by those three circles that this is a description of going deeper and deeper into sin. Think about it. You've lost sensitivity, you're giving yourself over to sensuality, and you start right back at the top again because you always want more, more, more. 
I can think of so many times I have talked with people who have found, as a pastor, who have found themselves in a consuming sin. It, it just, you can, you can work with them back to the stages of where it began. And where it ends up is they just wanted more because somehow what they got to begin with, whether it was drugs or drink or whatever, wasn't satisfying anymore. It had reached the, a limit. Uh, that's a depiction right there of, of the way we were. Okay. Can you think of some modern day examples of this kind of lifestyle? I'm not going to leave you in this depressed mode because Paul doesn't leave you there. So this is only half the story. But unless you can tell clearly about how bad off we all were, you're not going to have appreciation for how well off we are or the motivation to be holy. And what's worse, you have to pay for it, <laughs> right? You're paying for that. And usually it's cable, right? So you're paying for it. And... Okay. You know what? That's what Linda has decided to. I'm not supposed to talk about Linda, but that our family has decided that too. We just can't take it anymore. Okay, so in case you couldn't hear, Karen said that um, one of the, examples is the gradual acceptance of bad language on television, for example, and where we ended up today. Yeah, I, I remember, okay, this is, I remember my parents, so that we were pretty young, when smoking and beer commercials came on television, they, they well, actually, they had the youngest of the family <laughs> go up and turn down the dial. We did not listen to that. That, that was just in the early 60s. Then Archie Bunker came in the 70s, and it went downhill from there. So you're, that's a good one. The gateway drug, that's a good example. Yeah. Yeah. Right, and they just... Yeah, it just keeps going deeper, doesn't it, with drugs and addiction. And more. And that's just a physiological truth, right? It... Wow. That's it. Right. So Bill was describing people who have taken drugs, gotten off of it, tend to have a bad day in the future and take the same amount they had been taking and it will kill them because their body has gotten used to being off of it. Yeah, it was Esther. Oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Everything. That's a, a great observation, uh, Buster. Yeah, so that 
the ancient Greek and Roman times, they had they had their own corner on the market of uh, sin. Yeah. Okay, so let's go down to uh, back to Ephesians two four. Yes. I think it was for Paul. So is it a black and white issue? Uh, because the, the, we, we all know there are people that are better than this for whatever reason, that, who are not Christian, right? So there are people who live a life that is quasi-moral and reasonable. What Paul says is that doesn't mean a whole lot because their relationship to God is lost. Just at some point, all of their human goodness is not going to get them there. So there are, there are some wonderful things in the next part that we do that I think will address that perfectly. I, I feel your, your pain now. <laughs> um, the phrase you've raised, anyone in verse 28, anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer. Wait a second. That's a Christian that he's talking to? But he lived in this society, especially around Asia Minor, Ephesus, that was all that they had. They, they thought stealing was actually, if you could steal and get away with it without it being caught, it's a good thing. So I can see what he's doing is there are even Christians who don't know yet what they should be doing, mixed in with people who know better. But what he's describing is a way of life that is the former way of living that you all were part of. Now there's a new way of living that you all need to become a part of. And what I'm trying to do is show you there's one major key thing that flips that for him. That's what we're going to look at now, okay? Yeah. Chapter 2, verse 4 through 10. But God, because of his great love for us, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. 
It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. In order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in the kindness to us in Jesus Christ. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. What I've written here is the but God in verse four makes the difference from the way we were to the way we are. And notice the three things and what was so sh shocking to me this time, I have forgot he repeated with Christ each of the times. He made us alive with Christ. He raised us up with Christ. And then he doubles it. He seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ, as if he couldn't say in Christ enough, right? I mean, this is like, I'm going to squeeze it in any way possible until, until these Ephesians get it through their thick skull. <laughs> Everything about our Christian faith is about our union with Christ. And for Paul, I think that makes the difference as to how we think about ourselves. It's that thinking about ourselves, this is the way you were, this is the way you are because of what God has done. It's not because of anything you have done or I have done. So he levels the playing field real fast there. But it's because God planned for something. Okay, remember last week we discussed in the first chapter in 12 verses, verses 3 through 14, the longest sentence in all of the New Testament, 12 times he uses the phrase in Christ or in him. He's come back to it, hasn't he? There's something about holiness in the book of Ephesians that deals with an understanding of be, what it means to be in Christ. Okay, so let me see if I can get us from point A to point B here. The third page. I'm really pulling out all the stops when I try to do artwork. Uh, so uh, hang on, let's see. So what Paul is saying is in, okay, look at the top where I have, we are seated with Christ. And I have a, a, a little box around that whole thing. And then I have a little box around one near the bottom. We walk worthy of the calling. The first one I call positional holiness, and the second I call progressive holiness. That helps me to remember what I'm talking about. What do I mean by positional? Well, notice what is described there. We are seated with Christ in the heavenly realms. Well, I want us to think about a parallel passage in Colossians, where Paul does the exact same thing. So listen to how he describes the being seated with Christ there, because I think that's the beginning of an answer to what it means to be holy in the book of Ephesians. Since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above. This is Colossians 3, 1. Where Christ is seated, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. And he says it again, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Here's the key, I think. We must learn to rest in God's presence in order to set our minds on things above. Holy walking begins with holy sitting. So I walk out of a relationship that I have with God when I understand my position in Jesus Christ. We are seated with him. We read that and we don't really know what it means. It's worthy of a lot of meditation. We are so united with Christ that we are in heaven with him. But we are also here. 
what does it mean? If we forget our position in Christ and the fact that any holiness must come from being in Christ, then we will walk out of our own strength. We must rest in our position in Christ and allow the knowledge of that truth and the experiential knowledge of Christ to transform our natures into his nature. Once we grasp our position, then we have something to do. Okay, think of it this way. When I come to Christ, I'm pretty much bent on doing something. I want to do. I'm excited about that. I want to do something for Christ. I think the best thing that we can do for someone who comes to Christ is to sit them down and to ask them to understand what it means to depend on Christ. What am I doing in this chair? All of my weight is seated in this chair. I am entirely reliant on the, the health of this chair to hold me up. That's something of what I'm after analogously when we come to Christ, we have to learn to sit before we walk, before we do. But we get, the, we get it reversed so much, don't we? The old cart before the horse. We start doing things out of our own strength rather than waiting on him and sitting in him and growing in him and what it means to be in him. I mean, Paul wouldn't have said it these 20 sometimes that we've already read it if there wasn't something vital about that, especially in the realm of holiness. If I cannot be holy by anything I do, then what is it I have to do? I have to rely on his holiness to live through me. Okay, so this is how I envision it, how I use this kind of a chart all the time. Grace comes down to us. That's you and me there with the circle, right? So grace comes to us, and what then becomes the motivating factor leading out is gratitude, thanks. Okay, so grace is given. Everything I do comes out of my gratitude for that grace. Grace, gratitude. All of the Christian life, I think, can be summed up right there. The trouble is I have to sit for that grace lands on me and understand in my re relationship with Christ and being in his presence, there's something transformative that happens there. When I learn who I really am in Christ, I get ideas for what I need to do. I get motivations for what I need to do. So all of the jumping up and down and running and the other pictures that I, the way we order our conduct in our lives this is just an expression of the gratitude we have. If we do not understand how rich is God's mercy and grace in seeding us in Christ, we will never have enough of the grace and goodness of God to live it out because we're not sitting in his presence enough. If we tap dance on the table of life and try to show God, thank you God because this is what we can do now for you, we end up putting the car before the horse. What if we sat in God's presence and got immersed in that? I know I'm sounding mystical, I don't care. It's, it's what I sense is really missing in today's Christian world. What if we rest in his presence before we do anything? Before we walk? Now, there is the next move, you can see the little strip down there below, we walk worthy of the calling of God. Ephesians 4 moves us into that. Walk worthy of the calling of God. That's what we'll talk about next week, which is on the, the next one with all the Colossians and Ephesians on it. So study that section for next week. But that's what we're going to focus on now that we got the seating right. Uh, we're going to move to what it means to walk in that. This might be extraordinarily fundamental for you and very simplistic, but my experience has been nobody teaches or has taught this in years. Um, this is just essential for our young people to get right. 
So I'm going to throw it out there to you for you as, and I as older people to get it right. Because we're going to be needed as mentors to these young people more than you could ever imagine. Uh, it, it, it is a challenging world that they face. And they're going to need to hear the heart of God in this. And I think this is where Ephesians can help us some on that. Okay, let's close with prayer. Oh, Buster, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I just think there's a whole lot that can happen in the sitting with Christ that shaves that stuff off of us. Uh, I think God's... Also, I'm not fearful that people who truly do this in, in Christ will end up just sitting the rest of their lives. I think when you sit in God's presence, he shows you people that need help, things that you're to do. I'm a firm believer that God is talking with us. Uh, Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. So I think there are ways in which God propels us into the world. But to understand the motivation of my heart and why I would do that for God's benefit, uh, I really need to sit in his presence first. Yeah. So thank you, Buster, for that. Let's pray. Lord, we pray that your word will hide itself deeply in our hearts. And we pray that whatever has been said tonight that is honoring of you and is needed for us will sink deep into our souls so that we might live for you in ways that we cannot even begin to imagine now. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Okay, we'll see you next week, everybody. And we had a mic tonight, yes. And apparently, we were live streamed, so uh, not that I could tell, but uh, apparently. Yes, we were, yeah. Good. Yeah, you could. Oh, we don't have focus next Sunday night. Yeah, and, and we don't have focus next Sunday night, because it's... It's, uh, okay, you're drooling. He was my teacher. No, but if, no uh, seriously, uh, September the 7th, we got our first teenagers, and I've got a group called Tent Revival. That's a, that's a quartet. It consists of Rocky Chavis, which is Judy Jacobs' cousin, and three other guys. And they, their, their music's sort of on the Southern gospel style, but it's going to be, in the commons, they're going to have their sound system, so it's going to get loud. Mm -hmm. But it's going to be a fun time. So that'll be September the 7th. And uh, what we always do for that is bring bring a covered dish with food inside the covered dish. And uh, thank you for that laugh. And uh, and we'll supply the meat. Hey, Don, it's good to see you, buddy. I know you got to go. But <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'm just having fun. Yeah. I love all y'all, and uh, uh, this is unbelievable when you think about the, what you have for you. I was at Henry Smith's Berean class at 430, and then coming in here and sitting in the back and listening to this tonight and the discussion, and it is on uh, Legacy 55 Plus or our website if you want to go back and look at it. No, okay. You can go back and look at oh, it. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> one one thing you. I learned tonight, if I can leave you with this, yeah. upstairs they said that Peter... Uh, in the, one of the chapters, it said his mother-in-law lived with Peter the last few months of their, her life. So, uh, Ruth. <laughs> was, I've learned two things. No. <laughs> That's my mother-in-law. I, I, oh, no, I know that. I just don't know why you said it. <laughs> I, I'm pretty certain that we do not have uh, sojourners or any yes. focus next yes, week yes. because it's of Labor the Day. Labor Day weekend. But then we'll have meet the week after that, everybody. It's good to see you all. <laughs>